Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and I am joined today by my friend Kurt, who is the operator and owner of Bear Arms in Scottsdale. A bunch of you guys uh, expressed an interest in a Q&A session with someone who owns and runs a gun shop. Um, and so I emailed Kurt, I'm like, hey, you want to do a q and I'll get some questions for you. So I have three pages of questions for Kurt, all about various things with a gun shop. So uh, these questions all, of course, come from the fantastic folks out there on Patreon and also Utreon, who make Forgotten Weapons happen uh, every day. So thanks to you guys. And uh, anything you want to say before we dig into our first question? Well, thank you for giving me this opportunity. Oh, I hope I do a great job answering the questions for you and for your viewers. Um, the only problem we have is I've watched every one of your Q&As, and, oh, and every one of them you have some type of libation. So I figured, Ooh. why not? Why buck this trend? And so. I know you like peaty scotches. I well, do. I'm not as into the peaty scotches, but I do like the Irish whiskey. So this is a peated Irish whiskey mm, that I would like for you to try. And so, well, well, well. We have our glasses and a little bit of water, if you so you wish. Certainly came prepared. All right. I try. Well. And uh, if you don't like that, we do have the classic Tullamore Dew, which is also uh, pretty amazing. Pretty sure I'll be quite happy with this. All right. So hopefully this will help to uh, lube us just a little bit to get more, a little bit more truth. <laughs> yes, we'll get the good answers good out of Kurt now. And it's just past St. Patrick's Day, so I figure why not stick with the Irish tradition. Makes sense to me. I'm not going to argue with that. All right. Smells good. Sláinte. Sláinte. All right. That's very nice. Yes, it is. A little more mellow than my... Lafroig. Yes, correct. Hence the reason I do like it. <laughs> All right. But here we go. We have questions. Yes. So our first question is from Levi. It says, how have online gun sales affected your business? That's That question has changed over the years. Just to let you know, I, uh, my family and I took ownership of Bear Arms in 2008. Uh, Bear Arms has been around in Scottsdale since 1995. So needless to say, the way online gun sales have affected the store changed drastically in that time frame. Um, initially, it caused us to be much more competitive because of selection and pricing and various other things that just like anything else online has become more available. But just in the last um, several months with the addition of charging tax on everything online <sighs> and shipping fees going through the roof, um, it hasn't affected us quite as much and also the availability because purchasing in our store is pretty much the exact same as purchasing online. So. We have a very large selection of inventory. It's one of the things we pride ourselves on. We have over 2,000 different guns on the floor for people to purchase. So that makes it a lot better for customers who come in versus a store that has 100 guns and says we can order you anything or just buy it online. Um, one little thing that's affected us slightly differently, and it's not necessarily online gun sales in particular, but online sales in particular, is people's assumption that if you see it online, you can click and have it the next day or it's immediately available. I cannot tell you how many people come in and say, I saw this Facebook post about a picture or a firearm that was just introduced 38 seconds ago. Do you have it? Well, no, we don't. Can you get it? Well, I can put it on order. Well, can you have it tomorrow? And that kind of stuff just more often than not doesn't happen in the gun industry. That makes sense. I think, so, well, I think that doesn't happen in a lot of industries. I think with Amazon and things like that today, people are under the assumption that if they see it, that they can get it immediately. And that is more often than not, not, uh, not possible, no? at least for a new product. Sense. So, All right. Uh, Lord Bacon says, assuming this isn't too personal of a question, uh -oh. what are the profit margins on firearms and ammunition versus accessories and apparel? I rarely see any gun store that doesn't also sell apparel, fishing equipment, and general outdoor gear. Um, profit margins change on firearms across the board. Uh, there is what's called minimum advertised pricing on a lot of on certain types of firearms, for example, big ones like Glocks and certain SIGs. So that's the least you're allowed to advertise it for and sell it for. So no matter where you look online, that's what the price is. Well, those also have the smallest margins in general. So um, it's kind of like I've, what I've heard gas stations. The gas, they're not exactly always getting money on or making money on. They want you to come inside and buy beer or buy uh, snacks, or whatever. And sure, and Gun industry is pretty much the same way in that firearms you do make some money on if you're doing it right, but we always prefer, you know, do you want fries with that? Would you like some ammunition, a holster, and ex any type of accessory, a training class? Um, that always helps with the margins, obviously, and helps us out. So, yes, <clears throat> if you find a store that just solely sells guns, 
I don't think they're going to be around for very long. Okay. So. Uh, Isogen says, there are tons of different manufacturers and models of firearms and related stuff like scopes available in the U.S. How do you decide what models to stock and what not to stock? There are perennial all-stars of any type of gun. You know, the, the Glocks, the Sigs, the Springfield, Smith & Wesson, you name it, Ruger. That you're always just going to have to stock. Um, <clears throat> when it comes to new product, a lot of it is what is the internet saying is cool and, and hip, and we try and get some of those in. Of course, what's available, because sometimes you have various products, whether it might be a scope manufacturer, um, obviously firearm uh, accessory, that just isn't available. Like, it might be the new cool hotness, and every YouTuber's got it, but you just can't get it. So, <coughs> we, yeah, I won't say anything about that. Um, but a lot uh, of it, and of course, is customer demand, because I cannot tell you how many times we have found out about a brand new product from a customer who's come in and says, they whip out their phone, do you have this? And we said, well, what the heck is that? Oh, it's just some brand new thing. And sometimes they're, they hit on it. We research it, oh my gosh, this is kind of cool. Just introduced, let's bring it on. So, so with the more common stuff, things that have been around for a long time, existing brands, mm -hmm. is there any sort of rhyme or reason to, well, we are gonna stock this tube-fed 22 semi-auto, but not that one? Is there a lot of difference in margins or do you have like minimum purchasing requirements? One thing I should have started the video off with as a caveat is I'm speaking as a business owner in the state of Arizona in the Phoenix metro area. If you go to other parts of Arizona and definitely other parts of the United States, what they sell and is completely different or could mm. potentially be completely different. I have friends who own gun stores in different states and sometimes all they sell is hunting rifles. We do sell hunting rifles but near, not nearly as much as they do. Um, so. I'm speaking from just our personal experience, so don't you know, take it all with a little bit of a grain of salt, but we usually try and stick with the brands that most customers ask about, um, the ones we've had best availability for, less along the lines of profit margins because margins are kind of about the same as you go, so we don't like carry this brand because we make more money on it. But um, it's a lot of it has to do with years and years and years, if not, well, decades of trial and error. Sometimes you you buy in on something and you knock it out of the park and other times you buy in and it sits forever. So okay. then you just don't reorder. Uh, as sort of a follow-up question from Joel, are there any brands or manufacturers that you choose not to stock due to lack of quality or other issues? Um, or do you more take a line of like, well, if people are willing to buy it, I'm willing to sell it. They, uh, one thing, we get a very common question for new gun owners especially, which is, um, you know, what kind of gun do you recommend and then how good is it? You know, what's their warranty? And firearms are, at least I think, a lot like cars in that 40 years ago or 50 years ago for sure, uh, the American car industry was not doing too well. It was just basically make a product and put it out there and somebody's going to buy it. And then the Japanese car market came in and said, we can make something that's reliable and affordable. And that caused other people to up their game. Well, for example, sorry to throw anybody underneath the bus, but when I first purchased the business, even before I owned it, when I worked in the business, Taurus was horrible. And the mid 2000s, we were, we had to send so many Tauruses back that my shipping manager had their return address memorized. He, he knew it. <laughs> well, they have since turned themselves around and we've had um, very good luck with them. And most, if not all, gun manufacturers that know that they're going to put a product on there, especially with social media and the way information is exchanged these days, they know that if they make a crummy product, no one's gonna buy it. So most, if not all, gun manufacturers now make a pretty darn solid product. Now okay. some are better than others when it comes to features and the quality of the fit and finish and materials, but there really isn't anything that we send back more than anything else. Okay, oh, that's really interesting. So, mm -hmm. That's heartening. Yes, <laughs> it, 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 thankfully, it's been good. So buy most everything with confidence. Okay, so there really isn't anything where you have to face that dilemma of well, people really want to buy it because it's super cheap, but I know I'm going to get a lot of returns. We, um, what we ran into with certain items, and it wasn't just necessarily firearms, we had it happen with a few other products, uh, holsters and some knives, where people wanted them, they were hot, and we were getting so many of them back that we were spending more time dealing with customer problems than we were selling it, and the customers were ticked off because sometimes they feel like you, though you sell the product, you kind of are responsible for making it. So I said, we will help you out. We'll return this, we'll get it fixed, but I don't make it. So I can't go in the back, fix it, and then have it out to you. And they don't want to wait three or four or six weeks for something to be fixed. So we were getting so many people who were disappointed in us 
that we stopped carrying the product because we just hmm. it was it was becoming more of a hassle to deal with. Okay. But you kind of after you do business for decades and decades, you figure out what you don't want to deal in and you just kind of stop that. But again, firearms wise, that's pretty much not happening anymore, or at least very little. Okay. Uh, Matthew says, what are your top selling rifle, pistol, and shotgun in the $400 to $800 price bracket? If you want to cut that down to just one or two of them, is there anything well, that really jumps out? The interesting thing about the price bracket that he mentioned is pretty much everything of a good quality that you would want to own falls in the $400 to $800. Like, okay. you name it. Again, uh, pick any brand. Walther, uh, Sig, CZ, Springfield, Glock, uh, anybody, Ruger, Smith & Wesson. They all make something awesome in that price range. So, of course, the perennial All-Stars Glock, I mean, they just, they, they're the ones that uh, everybody wants. They have become the Kleenex or the Xerox of the firearms industry. If somebody's a new gun owner, they come in, they say, well, my friend told me to get a Glock. I said, well, you know, do you know what a Glock is? No, no, this is what they said to get. And it's become a ubiquitous name, which isn't a bad thing because they earn that reputation. But um, there, uh, there is everything falls into that category. Okay. And it's kind of the same thing with rifles. I'm assuming he means more, at least we carry more of the tactical style with ARs, you know, Smith & Wesson Sports, Ruger AR556s, those ARs that are provide you everything you need, nothing you don't, in a reasonable price range. We sell the heck out of those. Um, and shotguns. It, I would. I used to say Mossberg and Remington, but Remington going out of business, getting bought, coming back ish. Um, we, ish. you know, Mo, yeah, Mo, Mossberg's definitely dominating that market. Um, we also sell a heck of a lot of Benelli, so hmm. we're a big Benelli dealer, and there are a lot of Benelli pump action shotguns that fall well into that category. Okay. So, cool. Sorry for the broad answer, but it was any particular model of Glock that stands out as a, a particularly the, popular. The nineteen. Okay. The 19 Gen 5, the 19, well, any of the 19 series, which is the mid-size Glock. 17's big, 19's mid-size, 26 is small. You just, they're just the one that everybody gets. Uh, the big thing, and I'm sure there'll be a question about it a little bit later, but the big thing that's really taken the market by storm in the last several months, or several years, let's say, are the micro compact 9s, things like the SIG 365, Springfield Hellcat, Glock 43X, Ish kind of because it falls into that, but those type of firearms are definitely taking the market by storm. Okay. But still, the 19 is a perennial all-star from Glock. Okay. Uh, Ripley, what is the one thing you wish customers would stop doing in your store? Do I have to limit it to one? <laughs> you can give us top three. Sorry. Um, the actually, we we love our customers, and I joke a little bit. Um, the one, the first thing that comes to mind when you ask me this question that's unintentional is people ejecting magazines unintentionally onto the uh, glass of the display case or onto the ground or dropping the guns. It happens <laughs> way more than you'd think. People just holding it and they're talking, they drop the gun or they eject the magazine right into your glass. That's um, very annoying, um, especially when they break things. Um, <clears throat> there is something called showrooming in the industry, but it's actually not in the, it's not as much now it was several years ago. Same thing that happens at places like Best Buy or things like that, where people go in, they ask you a million questions about a product that you have, have you demonstrated it, do everything like that, and then you spend a half an hour with them, informing them about a product, and then they say, oh, thanks so much, and then they go, and then 10 minutes later we get the phone call, hey, can you do a transfer in? I bought it online. I don't think that's very fair to a gun dealer. That hasn't happened as much lately because of COVID really changed the dynamic, but um, that was something I found to be unfair as a business sense, owner yeah. is you're trying to help people with what they need you're trying to give them the best product and customer service you can and then they literally take all of your time and then just buy it somewhere else to save 20 or 30 bucks so but um that again that hasn't happened as much recently and i have to say ejecting magazines on the floor is a big one okay or going off the assumption that and i've had this happen too recently uh you somehow make uh, 50 percent margins on firearms and you know, I have people come in oh I know you know I work in the jewelry industry and I know if you bought if you're selling that for five hundred dollars you pay 250 bucks for it like, no no I didn't and they expect you to offer these insane discounts because they know that you're making you know keystone on something it's like I'm it, not gun margins are pretty low they are quite yeah quite slim in general so making the assumption I guess that you uh, know how much money you make and that therefore you can negotiate some insane you know people will ask for 50% off really 
Oh yeah, huh. they they will literally ask for fifty percent off of a gun, and I'm not talking about a five thousand dollar gun. Sometimes I'm talking about a three hundred dollar gun. <laughs> They'll say I can you know I can get it online for one hundred fifty bucks. I'm like no, no you can't. So you should sorry. do that immediately. Yes, I would say <laughs> I, I will buy all of wherever you're trying to buy because I want them for that price. But that's just me. Okay, uh, David says what would uh, what would be the biggest thing to consider if someone is debating starting a gun shop. I'm tempted uh, okay. to refer to my interview with Tony Neofitu, where someone asked a similar question about designing a gun. And his answer was, I'd advise them to sit down and rest until the feeling passes. Well, my <laughs> question would be specifically, do you want to start a gun shop or do you just want to get an FFL? Those are two different things. Uh, federal firearms license, you can deal, you don't have to have a storefront. Gun shop is a storefront. But my question would be, why? Why do you want to do it? That's the biggest thing. Because I cannot tell you how many times I've seen people even friends of mine, who've gotten FFLs, federal firearms licenses, because they want to get guns cheap or have access to guns that they can't get somewhere else. And then they realize, well, wait a minute, it's not that much cheaper. And then you have to keep up with all this paperwork. And then, wait a minute, if I'm dealing out of my house, I'm then allowing ATF to come to my residence to inspect my books and inspect my guns. And now I have to keep my gun store guns uh, separate from my personal firearms. And if you say, hey, I want to get into firearms, it's what I like, I want to make it my business, that's going to be my driving force, go for it. If you say, I just want to do it as a hobby to make a few extra bucks on the side, you know, maybe I'll do a gun show here, but my main business is X, Y, Z, I don't recommend doing it because nine times out of 10, it just doesn't work. Uh, it's not a good hobby. Um, I'm one of the very few stores out there, um, at least in Arizona, that is owned by our family. This is what we do. Many, many of the other gun stores are run by people who are, they made their money elsewhere, tech, real estate, something else, and then they came in with all this extra money and said, you know what, I like guns, so I'm gonna start a gun store because I've had this extra money. Well, they've got income from over here that's helping to subsidize the gun store. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't, but just getting a fire, federal firearms license or just starting a gun store because you like guns is not not something I recommend. So I have to agree with Tony on that one. We had a follow-up question, and I think I actually took it out of the list because we got way more questions than we could answer. But someone asked, um, how has like how much more shooting have you been able to do now that you're in the gun business? Zero. Right, and I'm um, thinking the people I've talked to, like, oh, as soon as I got into being a professional in the firearms industry, I no longer have any opportunity to actually go shoot and do the things that I used to actually enjoy about it. Well, I... I enjoy the firearms industry for different reasons other than just shooting. And um, some of my employees and friends make fun of me because I don't go out shooting as much as I used to. In fact, the last time we was out, I was out shooting was when we filmed the, Brown, the <laughs> Browning M2 video uh, shooting our 50 caliber machine gun. That's how long it's been. That's been a couple of years. It has been. Um, and I have, I'm semi-newly married, uh, four years now, I have a two and a half year old son. And so what free time I have, I spend with my family and not out shooting. But when you're actually running a business and this is what you're planning on doing um, the joys of oh I'm just gonna go out shooting um, they get put on the wayside for various other things now my employees a lot of them go out shooting quite often I have a couple guys who are into the tactical stuff some guys who are into long-range shooting like high you know these guys do it every weekend and they're beginning with but when you own a business that becomes your and you do it right it becomes your life and um, you have to sacrifice things and shooting is one of them all right, back to our formal list here. Sure. Uh, ben says, howdy, as someone interested in obtaining a CCW permit, as many people have in the past two years, what should I know or have when buying a gun for the first time? Any advice for first time gun owners would be appreciated. Sure, um, so Arizona is, okay, just to go back a little bit again, uh, federal law dictates you have to buy a handgun in the state of which you are a resident, so you have to buy your handgun in Arizona. So I'm talking about Arizona, handgun purchasing in Arizona um, CCWs. Now we also have uh, constitutional carry in the state of Arizona, meaning if you can legally carry the firearm, say externally, then you can conceal, legally conceal carry it. Most places, there are a lot of exceptions to these rules. But, so for example, buying a handgun in Arizona, um, I would say, or getting a CCW, I would highly recommend first trying out some guns, going to a range that has, and I send people to our competition all the time who have ranges that can rent things, try out, see what you like, see some things what you like. Get yeah. educated first. Um, ask your friends. A lot of people have firearms, so ask your friends, hey, would you mind taking me out? I'd like to get into guns, blah, blah, blah. 
and then come in here and talk to us. We'll put a bunch of different things in your hand and let you try them out. Then, here's the big problem that a lot of people run into, is they try and find the perfect gun. I need the gun, the one and only. And I say, well, and it sounds kind of like a salesmanship thing, but it's kind of true. I said, well, you don't have one pair of shoes, right? You have many different shoes for doing many different things. If you're looking to get into firearms ownership, don't think you need one gun that does it all, because those don't it really won't. exist. Yeah. A target gun is set up a certain way, a concealed carry gun is set up another certain way. So um, there's a thing that some customers run into, we call analysis paralysis, which is they research, and I'm not joking, I've had people research for over a year that they've been coming back to find the perfect gun for them. Just find a gun or narrow it down to a couple you like, buy it, and enjoy it. Because spending three months researching is fine, but then buy it and then spend the next eight months shooting it, learning to use it, use it um, become more comfortable with it. Because that will be more beneficial to you than researching for another six months and then trying to find that exact right gun. They just don't exist. I had an interesting experience like that with precision rifle shooting, which for a short time I was looking at getting into. And I ended up, I bought a Ruger Precision Rifle, which was brand new at the time, and it was the hotness. Mm -hmm. And it's actually, it was a, a relatively economical gun for its capabilities. Mm -hmm. Very good quality guns. Yeah, and what I've got, I've gotten to the point, what I've realized is, if someone is looking to get into serious long-range precision shooting, I tend to recommend that Ruger Precision Rifle on the basis of, you don't need to buy anything fancier or more feature-filled until you can actually elaborate what the features are that you need and why you need them. Very good. And I think very something well very similar applies to a concealed carry gun or kind of a first pistol in general. Like if you're looking Correct. at all of the polymer frame Wonder 9s, unless you can specifically say why is that FN better than this Glock or that CZ, then it doesn't matter. You'll buy one and in a year you may discover, oh, I wish I had this specific feature for this reason. Like, my hands are this weird thing, and I occasionally bump mm -hmm. the slide release when I'm shooting, but I wouldn't on that brand. Yeah. That's when you come back, exactly. sell what you've got, buy a new one, or just keep what you've got and buy a new one. And... In general, firearms hold their value pretty well. So if you buy a gun for $500, a year from now it's not going to be worth $100. So you can always resell it. And there's also, no again, here comes a salesman, there's nothing wrong with owning more than one gun. You can buy one and shoot it and say, this is great, but after a year of practicing with it, I decided I want something a little bit smaller that's a little bit more svelte for me to carry, whatever it happens to be. Keep your one gun, buy another one. That's, that's fine. And you're going to be a better, you're going to be a better shooter, you're going to have more skills, you're going to be better off having had the experience, even if it's a gun that you end up getting rid of later on and replacing. Correct. Than if you spent that entire year trying to figure out what the perfect one is. You'll yep. end up buying it and now, now you, you're starting from zero right there. Right. All right, uh, Ryan says, have you noticed any trends in demand for certain firearms that can be attributed to their appearance in social media, video games, or like recent events? So yes, those are um, three different things. The first one was social media, right? Yes. Social media, obviously, um, whatever's brand new and introduced, that's what comes out on social media. Man, oh man, this new product just get, got introduced today, I gotta have it, all that those, kind of stuff. All those darn YouTube influencers. Yes, what the heck's going on with those guys? <laughs> yeah. Um, but, uh, by the way, if you want to introduce me to some of those guys, too, let me know. <laughs> um, the, that's the social media one. Um, so, for sure. The second one was uh, uh, video, video games. games. Video games is actually something that I kind of um, really am happy about in an odd way. I don't play video games. I was never good at them because we never had a console back in the day in the 80s when I was growing up. So, um, I was never any good. But the amount of younger kids who come in and... Um, or know what a historic firearm is because they played with it in a video game is extremely impressive to me. Okay. And the fact that they come in with their dads and they might be six or eight or 10 years old and they know, we have a section of the store with all the historic American battle rifles on display from the end of the Civil War to current and there's a bunch of tripod mounted machine guns and a whole th bunch of things over there. And the amount of times that kids know more about those firearms than their dads do is impressive to me. Hmm. And um, one of the things we also pride ourselves here is we have a, what we call our Bear Arms Reference Collection. It's over a thousand different guns that we have accumulated over the years, mostly military-based. And when a kid says, man, I would love to hold an, you know, I've never seen an STG-44 in person. And I go in the back and I come out with one. I was like, hey, Dad, is it okay if he holds one? Their eyes just bug out and it's the greatest thing that they've ever seen. And I love bringing that joy to those kids because I hope that he remembers that 
And then maybe 10 years from now or eight years from now or four years from now, he comes back in here and says, hey, I'm, I can legally buy a gun now. And I remember how you treated me well. You didn't just brush me off because I was a kid because he was interested in historical firearms. And that's my bailiwick because I like the historical military firearms. So the fact that so many video games have influenced kids into learning more about, you know, they, you know, they know as much as a video game is going to tell them, but about historical firearms is awesome. Nice. So I love that. Okay. And the last one was... Uh, the last one was recent events. Well, recent events, what I'm going to go off, not necessarily anything like uh, war events, but when any type of saber-rattling happens in a government entity about mm. banning something, even oh. if it says, uh, hey, uh, it might be a magazine capacity ban, a ban on... Well, bump stocks is a bad example because it happened, but um, pistol braces, that's the next one that's coming up. Be ready for that, guys. Uh, anything like that, AR-15s, anytime there's some type of saber rattling or it gets in the public eye in recent events, bam, people, there's a line out the door, people who need to buy that AR because it's going to be banned, I got to have it beforehand, or a pistol brace because they're going to be banning them, I got to get it beforehand. So those type of recent events, the political ones, stateside, really do drive a quick bump in sales. Okay. So. It is very much a cyclical industry. Oh, 100%. Yeah. In, in many ways, it's almost a perfect bell curve time of year, at least in Arizona, but then also with election cycles, depending on who's going up for election, man, oh, man, it's just up and then way down. We had, uh, when Donald Trump was elected, it was called the Trump slump in the industry because everybody was betting on Hillary. Most people were. And so they all stocked up, getting ready to go. And then when Trump got elected, the market tanked. No and one expected that there was going to be any restriction on gun rights, so you don't need in to buy general, anything. And there were many stores that went out of business because they gambled, they bet the farm, literally, and bought 100 ARs, 500 ARs, this and then the next thing, and then they couldn't sell them. And people were driving around with U-Hauls trying to get rid of this stuff. Wow. And yeah, they, a lot of people went out of business. So. All right, our next question is from Walker, Walker, who says, what would you say is the most obscure or rare firearm to come through your door? This is one of the perks of owning a gun shop. Is you it's get, true. I you get, get first dibs. First dibs on the cool um, stuff. A couple things that, uh, let's see, Ian did a video on one of these, so I will uh, just let you know. This is a, a DWM Amber Crombie and Fitch Luger. There are only 100 of them out there. He uh, did a video on these, and I happen to know exactly what to look for when this one came in, so happy about that. Awesome. Um, this is one of the rarer pieces that came in. Um, you might notice from distance, it looks like a little 22 pistol with a stock holster, and you're not wrong. Um, but what is interesting about this is this is actually a Colt, pre no, I'm not pointing it at his head, a Colt pre-production Woodsman pistol. This is, marked serial, this is marked number three, but it's not serial number three. This is tool room example number three. So there are no markings on it whatsoever other than the parts. Um, the longer barrel, oddly enough, threaded for a Maxim silencer. That's super. Cool. Yep, original magazine, and it came in with the original stock holster. Um, the oddball story behind this, about an 89-year-old gentleman sold this to me, um, with, and he said his father owned a pawn shop in, I believe it was Los Angeles, California, in the 1940s, and kept this gun underneath the counter for personal defense, and somebody tried to rob the store and actually was killed with this pistol. Huh. And they just gave it back to him. He had no idea where it came from. I've tried to research it. I have no idea where it came from, other than it's in pretty darn good shape, and it is actually a tool room example. So this Crazy. is definitely one of the uh, rarer pistols that's ever come in the store. Yeah. So that's pretty neat. And um, uh, we also buy military items uh, from any country, anything interesting. And this came in the door. Uh, I had no idea what it was, and it turned out to be a Model 1924 uh, Chetnik bayonet, Serbian Chetnik uh, bayonet that there are very, very few of, and this has generated lots of interest by people online, and it is original. Um, interesting story behind is the gentleman who sold it to me was in the U.S. Air Force in, stationed in England in the 1960s, and he picked it up over there, brought it back, and just decided to sell it to me, but I had never heard of this. I thought it was some type of weird, well, It looks like a touristy, souvenir-y tourist yeah, thing. Yeah, kin, kin, kinjal style of knife, but is in fact legit, and so that's, that's definitely very rare. That's super cool. Several other fun things too, but video, we don't have enough we, time. We're we don't need to make this the video of Kurt's cool flexing collection. <laughs> we can. That'll be a different video. Okay. Uh, Jasper says, does the behavior of ATF staff change over time, particularly with change in administrations? Yes and no. So um, a couple things to let people know about ATF, uh, Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms here in Arizona, or at least in general. 
Um, the people that I deal with in general are the, let's call them kind of more administrative side. They deal with auditing our books, you know, if there's any trace requests, anything like that, they have questions on firearms. They're kind of over here. Then you have over here the guys who go, the ATF that goes after the bad guys, the criminals who are doing trafficking and you know, manufacturing illegal firearms. These guys kind of don't talk to each other. In fact, they, they don't talk to each other. That's what I've been told by ATF itself. So I deal more with these guys over here of the auditing our books. They have not changed much over the years I've dealt with them. Um, they come in in general, very cordial. Hey, we're here to audit your books. I say, fine, let's go. What would you like to see? You know, they audit our inventory. They audit our 4473s, which are the forms that you fill out to buy a firearm, make sure that everything jives and we don't have any errors. And then more often than not, they just go on their way. And we've been audited four times, 100% every time an audit, they just leave and say, thank you very much. Um, there is a branch of ATF that kind of makes more of the law. They don't make laws. Sometimes people think they do. ATF does not make laws, but they make suggestions. And that's where you run into things with the pistol braces, the bump stocks. They get to make interpretations of law. Correct. And <clears throat> that that has definitely changed with administrations. With the exception of the bump stocks under Trump, more often than not, um, I don't want to get too political, but when you have a more uh, left-leaning president, they tend to, ATF tends to want to get more done. Reclassifying firearms, coming up with new interpretations of various different things, whereas they kind of, they're not kept in check, but they're less likely to kind of go, pardon the pun, but guns out, uh, trying to justify making a new interpretation. And um, like I said, there's potential for some stuff coming down the pipeline in the next couple months here regarding pistol braces and the like. And it just seems sometimes, again, don't take offense to this government agencies, but just seems sometimes seems like they need to justify what they're doing. Like we're going to reinterpret the um, this design of brace or pistol or anything, and you're like, why? It's been fine for decades, if not more. What? Just let us go and enjoy it. Why do we have to do something? But um, so I don't want to get myself in trouble. Please don't watch this video, ATF. But uh, <laughs> that's kind of my my two cents on that one. Okay. So. Let's see. Thunderchild says, have you ever had any seemingly outrageous requests or orders that kind of make you think they're never going to pick this thing up, especially ones that actually went fine? Um, we don't take orders for things that we don't think people are going to pick up, so we make them put money down. We do get people, a lot of uh, people who, not a lot, but it happens where people email you like, can you get me some RPG-7 rockets? And of course, my response is, of course, how many would you like? And um, you know, just playing with them. We get prank phone calls. We literally had, and I showed you this before the video started, we had a uh, caller ID said Donald Trump, no joke. And the person asked us if we could buy, if they could buy 200 AK-47s and ship them to, the, uh, to Russia to help support Russia because they help them get elected. I was like, why is this? Why are you doing this? So <laughs> I we don't get, think that's real. I don't think that's real. Um, now, getting back to the kind of the meat and potatoes of the question though, I have had people come in who you're kind of surprised to actually do buy something in that um, I had a, I remember the first time at my old store location, we had a young 18 year old kid came in and he looked at, at the time, a Yugoslavian M53, which is a copy, mm. semi-automatic copy of a uh, MG, German MG42 machine gun. And they were made in eight mil. And it, I want to say we were selling for $2,500. Yeah. He had just turned 18 at the time. And he thought that was the coolest thing. And so I'm, I'm pulling this thing out of the case and it's a big pain in the butt. And I didn't think, he, I thought he just wanted to kind of see it. And then he said, awesome, I'll take it. And he whipped out a bunch of cash that he'd been saving up for his 18th birthday. And I was like, wow. Huh. So, but we never, we never shut down a customer or just say, hey, you're not gonna buy it because every customer has the potential of buying something. Yeah, so you never know. Yeah. that is like, that's just a plain old customer service thing. Like don't judge a book by its cover. Yeah, so. yeah that makes sense for sure. Mm -hmm. Uh, Brian says, do you cross post your inventory for sale on sites like Gunbroker and why or why not? Um, we currently do not. If you do go and visit our website, uh, bearearmsaz.com, make sure the AZ is at the end. We are in the midst of refurbishing it so it doesn't look as great as it could. But regarding Gunbroker, um, the only time that we post something on Gunbroker currently is if it's a brand new product because if you haven't already noticed this about Gunbroker, if you have something that's brand new, doesn't matter, Spring, Springfield Hellion or anything like that, uh, the um, Springfield SA-35, if you put it on Gunbroker, you will get, you will quadruple or quintuple your money on it if that first person has to have it. People will pay insane amounts of money to be the first person on their block to have whatever the new pistol is or whatever. 
that will be available, readily available in a few months. So that's what we do on GunBroker. Or the other end of the spectrum, we get lots of stuff as a gun store that's been around for a long time that comes in broken or parts guns or stuff that we just can't sell in the store. And there are people out there who love to buy fixed repper guns and mm -hmm. love to buy or need parts for something. So we put that kind of stuff on GunBroker. But putting just absolute basic inventory on GunBroker, at least for us, doesn't really make sense. It's, it's more time than whatever you would generate. You're also, your customer is going to pay shipping, which they wouldn't in the shop. They're going to pay sales tax like they would in the shop, and they're going to, you're going to pay gun brokers commission. Correct. Which you wouldn't have to pay if you just put it in the shop. Correct. So hence the reason why if you're selling something that you can make a lot of money on or is really have high interest or something you just can't get rid of that somebody's going to buy uh, for this project, those make sense. But putting basic inventory, that's not our business model. There are plenty of people who do it. And um, I don't fault them at all. It's just what we choose not to do. Okay. Uh, Ryan says, is the ban on Russian ammo uh, impacting overall supply as of yet? Um, and the short answer is yes, because of course, what happened the instant, um, it wasn't quite as much when the ban was put in, but definitely when um, the Russians invaded the Ukraine, that everybody flipped out and bought as much as they could online as fast as they could. So inventory dried up immediately. Now there is months worth of ammunition in the supply chain, stuff that's on boats coming over here, sitting in bonded warehouses, whatever. And so demand has come down a little bit, prices are have raised up and are kind of steady, but we're not seeing a huge change other than that at the moment. And I'm sure it's eventually just going to become one of those things you just get used to. You know, 7.62 by 39 will eventually be this price. And the cheap steel case 9 mil, unless it's made somewhere else, will start being made this price. And one thing I'm happy about the gun industry is very good at adapting. And if there's a, man, a plant manufacturing 762 by 39 in Russia that we can't use anymore, then they moved to Ukraine, which was actually happened, but now they didn't do that. So what? We'll move to the Philippines and we'll make it over there or wherever it happens to be. That's um, and you know what? We adapt. Prices, you know, meet their their level, and um, we go from there. So I don't like bans on anything, but we work our way through it. It's like the internet. Yes, it will yeah. reroute. Exactly, 100%. <laughs> uh, Eric says, what is it with shops charging an arm and a leg for transfer fees? Are prices high specifically to discourage buying online or out of state? Short answer is yes. That's, okay. um, again, kind of going back to what we talked about at the beginning. Gun stores, especially smaller family-owned gun stores, they have to be able to make some margins to be able to pay for the licenses, pay for the lighting, pay for their employees, pay for any benefits they give their employees. This kind of stuff has to be made in from the sale of a firearm or accessory or something like that. And I joke with my employees sometimes, I said, I don't pay your paychecks, the customers do. Well, if the customer wants to buy online, then you're giving they're giving that money to someone else. But they want to use your store location as the pickup point, which is fine, but I still have to pay that employee to do the paperwork and spend his time with you. And so if now with, again, taxes and shipping and the transfer fees, the gun is more expensive to buy elsewhere than buy in your store, then you're kind of funneling the customers into your store. And um, again, a lot of people tend to look for the, like, the lowest price and I gotta buy there, but they forget the ancillary things that come along with purchasing in a store. For example, customer service. If you buy a gun from me and it has a problem, we'll fix it for free. Or we'll deal with the business or the manufacturer for free. If you buy a gun online and transfer it in, and then it has a problem, I'm going to charge you to fix it because you didn't buy it from me. And so we have, you know, we're not greedy. We are capitalists. We're not greedy capitalists. We just want to be able to feed our families and keep the lights on and be here for you for many, many more decades. And it's a kind of a courtesy thing. Now, if, you're, if your local gun store happens to have some gun for 100% more on the shelf than you can find it online, that's a little bit different. But we try and be very competitive and very fair. Now, there's also a different situation with historical guns. True. Where you can't just stock Finnish most in the guns. I mean, you could at one point when they were first being imported in bulk. But Correct. if I find one of those things today, well, I'm not really competing with your store if I buy it online because you don't have one and you can't just order one. Correct. And we don't have any problem with doing transfers in for people like that. They, you know, they call up and say, hey, I bought a, you know, a 1919 Winchester 1894 on Gun Broker. Can you do a transfer? Of course. We'll be more than happy to help you out because we don't sell that. But if you bought a, again, going back to the classic, a Glock 19 online, and then you're actually going to spend $40 more buying it online than buying it from us, we'll tell you, hey, we have that in stock. You know, why don't you just come on in? We, you can have it today. Why wait the time and have it shipped? 
So, um, but m we don't charge exorbitant transfer fees either. I have heard of many stores that charge seventy-five or a hundred dollars to do a transfer, and they just basically just don't want people to buy online. That's that's a choice for the business to make. So, okay. Uh, but da, 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 da. Morgan says, "What has been the biggest positive change in the business since you started, and what's been the biggest negative change?" Interesting. Um, biggest positive change. I would have to say, in general, probably the widening of the customer base in that with these several events that have happened, with COVID probably obviously being the biggest, but we have seen a very much a widening of our customer base, whereas 20 years ago, you could kind of say, well, this is kind of our target customer. And oh, I'll get guy. asked, yeah, yeah kind <laughs> of, um, I'll get asked this a lot by people coming in to do marketing with me. They say, what's your target market? Well, nowadays, it's so broad. You can't even say it's obviously male. We have more male than female, but the female market is huge. You know, we have 18 year olds coming in buying guns. We have 80 year olds coming in buying guns. The broadening of the market, and I cannot tell you how many people came in during COVID at the very beginning of COVID who said, I never thought I'd own a gun before, but because of, you know, the riots that are going on down the streets, or I'm worried about social unrest, I, I need to buy a gun to protect myself. And so those people hopefully bought the gun took it to the range, learned how to use it, became familiar with it, enjoyed it, versus just throwing it in your drawer. Because one of the first things we told these people is this is not some type of magic talisman that's going to make bad go away. So just because you own it, you know, if you own a violin, you're not a mu musician. So yeah. um, please learn to use it. And we hope that those people learn that firearms aren't bad things. It's just, just a tool like anything else. And guess what? Once you get to learn how to use it, maybe that'll start to sway them in the direction of, well, you know, I heard online that they want to ban this or I saw on TV that this bad thing happened, but I know it's not the gun's fault. And I hope that the broadening of the customer base will be, um, you know, will be the biggest, best thing that's been happening to the industry. Okay. I can certainly More edu edu education. Yeah. Like you're education about fire true firearms, firearms ownership, stuff like that. So what about the biggest negative change? Um, there... The negative changes in the industry are usually litigation slash some type of laws being changed. You, you, in some ways, you can't anticipate things like that, and then it's just, what do you do when it happens? Banning of an importation of a certain product, banning of a product that you had, um, changing of a classification of an item. Man, those things are some of the worst, and um, one of the big things that kind of came up during Obama, and again, not to get too political, but Hillary Clinton was harping on it, was allowing for the availability of a gun store slash manufacturer, you name it, wholesaler, to be sued for the misuse of their product. That's the kind of stuff that you worry about in industry, because if that thing happens, you're going to see almost everybody go away, because you can be litigated into non-existence. So you worry about laws changing. And then, so it's not one specific thing, but if I had to put in a category, it'd be the changing of laws because that can affect you overnight and then you have to adapt. And sometimes people can't adapt or industries can't adapt. Manufacturers can't adapt. Right. And then bang, you're done. It's gone. Okay. Let's see. Uh, Brett, what gun do you see returned the most? Um, kind of hitting on something that we talked about earlier. Uh, we don't. There is not, at least that we carry, there is not one thing that has returned more than anything else. At least I can't think of it. Um, and thankfully it's because, again, people have kind of gone to that Six Sigma production style of, we gotta make it the best because we know if we make something that's crummy, nobody's gonna buy it. The word's gonna get out there. Quick. Now, yeah. um, the caveat to that is if you are the first adopter, you're the guy or <laughs> girl who has to have that very first gun, be prepared for recalls or problems with it. Because guess what? That kind of stuff happens all the time. So that's not necessarily a fault of the, um, a certain style of gun. It's just the growing pains of a new design. Yeah, going from a 100-piece test run to a 10,000-piece production run, there are always issues. There always have been. There always will be. Correct. A manufacturer can't afford to make 10,000 guns, put 1,000 rounds through every one of them, throw them all away, and then start their commercial run. Correct. So to some extent, the first customers will always be the beta testers. Correct. And also one other thing that a lot of people don't realize about the gun industry is that no matter how large the manufacturer is, a lot of them subcontract out components. Mm -hmm. And so you might have a gun that's been around for a while, and then all of a sudden there's a recall on a certain serial number block or something like that because the subcomponent was of inferior quality. And so, of course, then all of a sudden we get a whole bunch of these pistols back in because there was an inferior part. Not necessarily even a design flaw. That is, of course, a quality QC issue. Right. So um, buy with confidence. At least the stuff that we carry, buy with confidence. But um, don't 
don't think that you're impervious from getting some type of recall or having these these are guns that are made by humans for humans so there's always a potential no okay. problem uh, let's see Matthew says what are some underappreciated firearms in the current market examples of like really nice guns people don't consider or don't know about oh man I um, I hate to admit it because I love both of these brands but the brands that probably get the least cred or at least people asking about them are Walther and CZ, at least in our store. And I love Walther products. You know, all of the PPQs, PDPs, great, everything the Q5 matches, everything they make is awesome. Um, CZ, same thing. The 75 is a B's perennial all-star. The, the PO1 series, even their polymer frame stuff, the PO7s, the P10s, everything, great product. But man, more often than not, when we're showing a new gun owner some guns and you take out four or five and show them to them, you take out a CZ or sometimes a Walther, and they're like, I've never even heard of it. Everybody knows the Walther from the PPK, which they still make, and still quality. But um, man, oh man, I wish that those guys could get more street cred out there because they make awesome product, and they kind of get left by the wayside. Then I don't know if it's marketing. I don't know if it's what it is, but man, oh man, lot, not a lot of people ask about them. And I know you were just I, at CZ. I got to visit CZ. The CZ guys, if they watch this, will be extremely happy to hear you say that. <laughs> I'm sorry. I get, love your product. Love the videos. I own many, many, many of your pistols. And don't get me wrong. Every time you put a CZ, especially something like a 75 Compact or PL1 in somebody's hands, like, wow, this is awesome. And we do sell them. But they don't come in and ask for them as much. Race guns like the Parrot and stuff like that, sometimes people do. But... I just wish that there was a way that they could get their name more out there, or, you know, okay. in the in the ether. Cool. Uh, Brett, different Brett, asks: Are any distributors much better to deal with than others? Um, I, I guess, do. So, I'm sorry. Go ahead. We should preface this with: the firearms business, the gun shop business, is a distributor-based business. Like, not all businesses are. Correct. Um, certain firearms manufacturers are dealer direct only. Okay. Certain ones are uh, distributor direct only, and some kind of do both. Um, so distributors are, are wholesalers. We purchase from them. We, you know, they sell it to us. They have a huge, huge warehouses, you know, multi-million dollar warehouses that have millions of different products in them. And that's where we get our stuff from. And then we put it on our shelves and market it to the customer. Um, I deal with a lot of large wholesalers, um, RSR, Lipsy's, Iron Valley, Sports South, uh, Hicks, Bill Hicks, all these guys, uh, Davidson's. Um, and they're great. I love dealing with them. There are some wholesalers who I don't mention, or I won't mention, who I do not like to deal with because they play a lot of, when, when the market is normal, they play a lot of games, which is like, hey, do you want this, this new hot product? You need to buy three of these things then mm -hmm. so that they can move stuff that you don't want. And anytime somebody pulls that kind of shenanigans on me, I choose not to, um, to purchase from them because we have great relationships and they know that if I want this, they're going to offer it to me and I will 100% buy it and I'll help them out at some other point and I'll buy whatever that knickknack is that they need me to buy at a later point. But to basically blackmail me into buying three things that I don't like just to get one thing I do like, I don't like dealing with those kind of wholesalers. That's just me. That's the uh, auction lot thing. Pretty much. All right. Uh, Math. Oh, no, we did him. Uh, Jack says, how has... Oh. <laughs> How has being engaged with firearms as a business uh, changed your engagement with shooting as a hobby, which we oh. already talked about? Yes, I have very little time to shoot. Yeah. Not, no time. I so thought that's just I, me. I thought I deleted that question, but Jack, you're in luck. I did not. Congrats, so, Jack. All right, uh, Bear Independent hey, says, yeah. I personally know a couple gun shop owners that are going out of business due to issues with the supply chain. They can't get firearms or ammo. How are you <laughs> doing with those issues? Kind of going back to the previous question about the um, distributor relationships and manufacturer relationships. One of the things that happened, um, I'm sure what he's talking about is COVID. And when COVID hit, the supply chain just completely emptied out. And from an uh, interesting standpoint, I was talking to somebody that had dealt with uh, Ruger. Mm -hmm. And they said that they have mm -hmm. basically you know, guns ready to ship. And they kind of had guns set back that were just extra in case we get a run. And they had parts for guns. And then they had raw materials you know, set aside. And the supply chain cleaned out so much that they literally didn't have the raw materials to make anything. Wow. So when the supply chain runs out that much, guess what? You better find a way to make money or have savings because that's what happened to a lot of people in the gun industry. So um, your friend or the people that you know, I, I, I don't want anybody to go out of business and I feel sorry for them, but sometimes it's just, you can't. And I have 
friends who owned restaurants that went out of business because they couldn't get people to work for them or because of COVID restrictions. And depending on where you're located, I can see the same thing happening with the gun industry. But um, the fact of the matter, one of the other things that happened uh, to us too, and I thank my father for this and teaching me, he's like, you know, don't spend all the money you got, put some stuff in savings. And so when we got ammunition, or I'm sorry, when we couldn't get ammunition and we couldn't get certain types of firearms, but the bills, guess what? The bills kept coming. Um, we had some savings that we were able to tap into. And smaller gun stores that try, especially the ones who always try to play the low price game. You know, mm -hmm. I'm gonna put 20 bucks on top of whatever wholesale costs and sell it to you. Unless they're making money elsewhere or have savings set aside, they're not gonna work. And I'm not saying that these people are that way, but um, those people were the first to go. But having great relationships with your wholesalers is imperative because when they say, hey, we just got a pallet of nine mil in and you know, we have 20 different reps and each rep got 10 cases of ammo and uh, I, each rep has 40 different accounts. So I only got 10 cases of ammo, 40 accounts, but you're one of my best accounts. You get one case of ammo. That kind of stuff really does pay off. So again, I, my heart goes out to these guys who are really trying and then lost their businesses. But relationships is a big thing. Um, some gambles. I did take some gambles of buying ammunition at higher prices than I normally would just to be able to have it on the shelf to sell it and you know we weren't making that much or if not anything sometimes we were even selling at cost but at least kept people coming in the door and you hope they bought something else that, that we did sense. have um so you know some gambling in there okay. but pre preparation as best as possible save some money invest in something else have some way to make money other than just a gun going back to the very first question accessories you know you name it ammunition whatever you can get find a find a good way uh wild bill cody Probably not the original one. Oh man, I love talking with him. <laughs> Says some FFLs do not accept CNR licenses. For example, I've been, uh, for example, having to do a background check for a firearm that's over 50 years old. I never figured out why. Just that's our policy. Uh, where does that come from? Um, I'm not exactly sure where that comes from because we don't do that. Um, if you bring in a CNR and you have your ID that matches, doesn't matter to me. I can assume one of maybe two things. I think two things. First off, FF. Uh, ATF has a website called FFL Easy Check where you can mm -hmm. punch in the FFL's number, first three, last five, and it'll tell you if the license is in fact valid. That's what that way it prevents people from just downloading some FFL off the internet and you know, you know, or making just up a number. Making yeah. up a number. You cannot check CNR licenses on the website. At least the last time I checked, you couldn't do it. You can't because they're not public information. There you go. The way a regular FFL is. There you go. So if this FFL chooses to there well to look at this license even, there's no way for him to verify it is in fact legit. So at least not, not that I'm aware of. So therefore he's assuming some type of responsibility. The okay. second thing that I kind of assume might be more of the store policy is the ATF agents who have audited his books in the past. Um, they have a enormous influence on how you do business. Ask me how I know. Um, sometimes when you deal, going back to again the ATF question, sometimes you'll an ATF agent will audit your books, audit your intake, and then a couple years later you get audited again and they'll say, well, why are you doing this? You shouldn't be doing it this way. And so, well, the last person who did it told me to do it that way. Well, that's not the way you should do it. You need to do it my way. I had a shop here in town that I used at one point where in the, on the 4473, every place there was a date, like your date of birth, you had to fully spell out the month. If it was January, you couldn't say 01. It had to be, and it couldn't be Jan. It had to be January. And it's because they had an auditor who gave them a really hard time about that, which mm -hmm. isn't a thing, but when the auditor says it's a thing, it immediately becomes a thing for them. 100%. First off, you cheated on me. Go to the last time ago. Okay. I'll it was actually it. a shop down in Tucson. Oh, okay. Oh, sure. Okay. <laughs> I feel okay then. No, just kidding. Um, anyhow, but yes, um, that that is a thing where you will have an ATF agent who comes in and tells you you have to do it this certain way, otherwise. Um, I can, I'll take your license. And they don't say it that way. Um, they have what they call, well, when you get audited, you have a, vi if you f do something wrong, they'll call it a violation. Well, if they come back and audit you again, and you have that same violation, they call it a willful violation. And a willful violation is, hey, we already told you, you did this wrong, yet you choose not to do it. And in theory, they, with one willful violation, they could take away your license. So, if that person happened to have been audited by ATF and said, well, you didn't get maybe a person's driver's license number on this with a CNR license, um, and this person just said, you know what, screw it. We don't see enough of these to make it worthwhile. I'm not going to deal with it. So that is 100% the way store policy. Um, I don't fault anybody for having that. We have various store policies here that uh, some people might not agree with, but 
um, that is our store policy, is we accept CNRs. Okay, cool. Uh, Valentina says, in your opinion, what makes a gun store bad? What red flag should a customer be on the lookout for when they step into a new gun shop? Um, I wouldn't say there's anything bad. There's definitely things that are different. Now, obviously, the obvious first is just customer service. If they treat you like crap, um, they ignore you, they talk down to you, um, make sure before you completely blast them on Google or Yelp or any of that stuff, make sure that you just the person you're dealing with isn't having a bad day, that maybe that guy just... Or human. It, yeah, it happens. It, it can happen. Um, but if that seems, seems to be a trend in the gun shop itself, I would say uh, I, there are plenty of other gun stores. Ignore that one. Um, again, one that I kind of worry about just in general is the whole like low price. We can get you anything you want. We have 10 guns on the wall or 20 guns. Like We're going to be your low price leader. Those 10 places tend not to uh, last very long. Um, some make it, some don't. Uh, the people who, and this you'd have to go through the whole gun buying experience, but the people who offer no support, as in like you buy the gun, get out the door, who's next in line, and then you say you come back and say, hey, I want a holster, or hey, I had a problem. They're just like, hey, too bad, you know, you bought the gun, you handle it yourself. Um, I don't agree with any of that kind of stuff. We are always there to support our customers as best we can. So I would keep an eye out for that kind of stuff. Um, kind of like judging customers though, don't judge a gun store by its cover. Now you might walk in there, it might be kind of dusty and musty and some old guy behind the counter who's been there for 50 years, but that guy might know his stuff. So give everybody a shot. I love so, digging through those places because every once in a while you find some cool thing in the back covered in dust. Yeah, I am one of those weird people who, even though I work in the gun industry 24-7, whenever I leave town, go to a different town or even a different country, if I can find a gun store, bam, I'm there. Because <laughs> I have found many things and made some relationships that are pretty awesome. So nice. I, uh, I'm really happy with that kind of stuff. So give everybody a shot, but I would say it just like going to any type of restaurant or something like that. If you have a bad meal the first time, maybe give it a second try, but if it keeps having, keeps being a uh, consistent trend, then I would, uh, I would skip that gun store. All right, we got two left. Okay. Um, sticking on the theme of poor customer service, Michelle yeah. says, as a female, why do most salespeople show us 22s, 380s, or 38s? I've even been told that women can't operate a semi-automatic. They lose me as a customer after that. I would, I would agree with Michelle, was her name? Michelle. Michelle. I would agree with you and Michelle on that one, that uh, a female can't operate this. Um, that's BS. We talked about it earlier in the, uh, the questionnaire that the broadening of the customer base is extremely important to us. And females are a huge, huge new market. That's, it's not a new market, but an evolving market. Um, some ladies come in the store and they're offended the fact that we have purple guns or pink guns. And then there are some ladies who come in who just want those, and guys, who just want those purple or pink guns. So that's why we carry them. It's not just for ladies, but some like it, some don't. Um, one of the, I think the biggest question or problem that she might have had happen to her is when a customer comes into our store, let's just say it's a female customer, and says, I've never owned a gun before. One of our first questions to them is, how familiar are, are you with firearms? So, have you ever shot a gun? Have you ever held a gun? Because that makes a huge difference versus somebody who says, oh, well, I've never owned a gun, but I grew up shooting all the time. My dad took me out, or my, my ladies' uh, friends, we go out every Thursday night and go shooting at the range. Um, and we say, okay, what are you interested in? Um, there is definitely something to be said for dexterity in that some people, male or female, it doesn't make a difference, cannot, don't have the grip strength to be able to cycle the slide on a semi-auto. And we'll hand these guns, and even something as easy as the uh, Smith & Wesson you know, Easy Shields, they're doing one of these, or then they rack it and gang, boom, right into the glass. That happens a lot. Um, those people probably shouldn't own a semi-automatic if they can't rack the action. And so what happens is some, if they want to stick with a semi-auto, they get pushed to a 22 because they have weaker springs, easier to use. Or they get pushed to a revolver, 38, because they can't operate it. Um, we never do that because of it's just a woman. And trust me, and it was, it's funny this question came up because just last week we had an 86-year-old woman come in who had owned guns before, but she was looking for a more of a smaller concealed carry gun. We happened to look at the SIG 365, and she picked that thing up, racked the hell out of it, pushed it out. She, was, she knew exactly <laughs> what she was doing at 86. We're like, wow, nice. tacti tactical grandma <laughs> was badass. And she, was, she had no problems taking the mag out. She knew exactly what to do. So her age... Her gender had nothing to do with it. And she can't bought make, the gun and was super happy. Can't make those assumptions. Exactly. Again, can't make those assumptions. That tends to be more of a older FUD 
you know, I'm, I'm, I've worked in the gun industry for 60 years, young lady, let me tell you how to do it type thing. I think a good gun store who hires good, I don't want to say younger employees, but good employees who are more apt to adapt, um, you shouldn't have that problem. It's funny, a little personal note. My wife got a new carry pistol a couple of years ago, and she very specifically wanted a hammerless 357 snub-nosed revolver. Mm -hmm. And so we went into a gun shop looking for one, because that's not the sort of thing that I normally work with. And I, I was sitting in there, I'm like, I'm not telling her to get a double action only snub nose 357. That's what she wants very consciously. And it, mm -hmm. it was actually kind of awkward for the beginning of the interaction. Like, because I felt like one of those guys who's like, ah, oh, she's a woman, oh, she needs a small 357 revolver because that's all she can figure out. Nope. That, no. Well, that's definitely one of the reasons why, again, we have so many different guns in our inventory. I want to be able to put out a bunch of different stuff for you to try and enjoy. And if one fits your hand better, great. And if you go with revolver, go with the 9 mil. 9 mil is usually what we push people towards for obvious reasons. Um, but it, it, we give you the options. And it has nothing to do with age or gender or anything like that or ethnicity. It doesn't make a difference. You are going to buy. Well, we want you to be happy with what you purchase. Nice. Because we want you to come back. If I just make a sale and then you know that money goes through the till, that's great. Except if you feel like you got, you know, pushed into something you didn't want or you got burned, then you're never going to come back. And then you're going to tell all your friends, and then they're never going to come back. And then bad times. Yeah. So. It's not so much gun stuff. That's just business. Bingo. Yeah. All right. We have one last question. Okay. Uh, oh, no, I'm sorry. We have two questions. Uh, Ryan says, what item, be it accessory or firearm, do you enjoy selling the most? Um, I wouldn't say it's an item, but a genre. Again, going back to the military historical items, I love surplus. That's okay. my bailiwick. I am um, interested in pretty much any type of military firearms, hence the reason I love watching your stuff so much, your videos. Uh, I Anytime somebody comes in and shows an interest in a historical military firearm, I like to answer as many questions for them on there as I can. Sometimes people come in knowing more about it than I do, and then they teach me, and that's, I love it. Nice. I will never say that I know everything about everything. I'm never an expert. I'm always willing to learn. And sometimes people come in and like, well, you see this mark? This means this, and this means that. I'm like, wow, cool. But I like selling that kind of stuff because it's each piece is unique, yeah. and each piece is, has a historical, usually some type of historical background, and um, I thoroughly enjoy that. Now, I don't have any problem selling a first customer, their first concealed carry handgun, that's great. Seeing the look on their face when they're so happy that I, I now have something that I've never, maybe never done before, or a new hobby I'm gonna start. I love that too. But um, genre-wise, it's definitely the historical firearms. Nice. So. All right, and our last question is from David, who says, what qualities or qualifications do you look for when hiring a new employee? That's a tough one, because it's with any business. Um, I would say, the one thing that I value the most in an employee from a business owner standpoint is trust. Because one of the biggest problems with any business, watch any of the shows, you know, Bar Rescue or any of those things on TV, what's the biggest problem that the businesses have with failing is theft, internal theft. I, as long If I can lay a $100 bill on my desk and a month from now I come back and it's still sitting there because all my employees aren't going to take it and pocket it, that means more to me than many other things. Because you can teach them about product, you can teach them salesmanship skills, you can teach them various other things. But um, trust is huge. Now, you can't really, you can't teach trust in a tough, you can't determine that in an interview. But um, that's the biggest thing. Uh, I would say next kind of is personality. Do they mesh with the personality of the store? in that I've had people interview who are extremely knowledgeable about firearms, but if they don't, if they're very dry or very, you know, like the, this is this is the way we sell, you know, we sell revolvers to females and we sell this to this, um, they're not gonna work here because they don't mesh with the mantra and the, um, the family uh, business that we have developed over the years. So you have to be able to mesh with the style of business we like to do. You have to be able to mesh with the other employees also, because okay. if obviously the employees don't like you, um, then that's not going to yeah, work. But um, we look for kind of the personality in an interview. Obviously, checking former work history, calling up references is very important because it's saying, man, this, this guy was an ass. I didn't want to work with him. Or you know, he was a know-it-all. He, he kept jumping in in every transaction I was trying to deal with. Well, you don't want to deal with people like that. But trust and personality, because you can teach anybody about any product. So, and you can even, again, teach salesmanship skills. Hopefully they listen, but that's, that's the big thing. Awesome.
Well, that is all of our questions. I think that was very interesting. Thank you very much well, for spending time. Thank you. I, I hope I uh, answered questions for everybody, and I hope you're listening. If, if you're still watching now, that means you found it interesting. So thank you so mm. much. Oh, mm -hmm. man, we're out. Got to mm -hmm. be refilled. Um, that was really good whiskey, too. Yes, yes it was. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity. <laughs> thank to your, your patrons and Nutrien folks for uh, supporting you. And um, if I can ask, or just say one thing about Ian in general. Uh-oh. The... He is amazing to watch film stuff because you think that um, he might just uh, film something, then crop and cut and crop and cut. No, he is a one-take wonder. <laughs> it is awesome to watch in person. So um, please support him in any way you can. Get your friends to support him. All that good stuff. All right. Enough of that. You're flattering me. Sorry. Have another drink. Yeah. All Hopefully right. you guys enjoyed the video. Uh, thanks very much for watching. We'll catch you next time. Thank you.